actually brought the interest in the center with the office. But also, you made the good stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. I think we're starting. I'm Jerry Gast, and uh, hello, everyone, in Eugene. I guess I'm on that camera. Okay. Uh, this uh, studio that I'm offering, it's not a terminal studio. It's a thesis studio. Uh, we call it, some of us call it that up here because we emphasize uh, self-generated projects, a self-selected project within a framework. And the framework here uh, is urban waterfronts. I've offered uh, occasionally uh, waterfront studios, which uh, I have developed a strong interest in because of my background in professional practice and also some additional studio work here in, uh, in Portland. Uh, in what I want to talk about first is just some process uh, parts of this that I think are important before we just briefly go over the subject. Um, I, be I believe very strongly in a uh, self-selected studio. I think that when a person gets to the final studio's final year of the program, uh, they should have the responsibility and the opportunity to select their own project. Uh, so that we don't have projects all over the board, we usually select a uh, loose uh, framework, a subject framework, and projects in a given studio fit into that framework. But uh, the responsibility, I think, is important. 95% um, of students in the past have really appreciated uh, being able to do a studio in this manner. And... Uh, Maybe for 5% of the people, uh, sometimes people can't make up their mind what they want to do because there's so many choices. Uh, some people, it may not be for everybody, but I, I do think it's, uh, it's important. Um, I like to have people select projects that are creative and visionary, but also grounded, grounded in the world of uh, of, uh, of social factors, grounded in economics, grounded in environmental and physical um, conditions. And so I like that balance between uh, vision and real world kinds of uh, anchoring. Uh, I also think it's important that uh, at this level that each project be based on a strong research foundation. Uh, we have a thesis prep seminar in the fall term. Uh, that allows students to do rigorous research on their project and produce a program. I'm quite proud of the programs that people have uh, produced uh, and, and the quality, not only of the documentation of the programs and booklets, but the, the thinking that has gone into them. So that becomes an important important part of the whole thing. Uh, in this particular studio, I'm offering the opportunity to uh, select a project in one of three locations, uh, Portland, San Francisco, and Brooklyn. Uh, I'm also open to waterfront projects in other parts of the world if a person has in the past visited that place. Uh, and projects that are not in the three focus cities, uh, I would like at least two people to team up to at least work on master plan and urban design work uh, in those contexts. I don't want to have like 16 different projects, uh, solo one-on-one -on -one projects all over the world. It's, it's good to have some collaboration. collaboration. So I'd like to see some collaboration at the master plan urban design level say, groups of two, three, four students, and then individual projects for, uh, for the buildings. Um, and I think that will be a nice mix. I, I like the collaborative idea, or I like the, um, the idea of having projects in a few different cities because it enables us to make comparisons between how cities uh, address these, these issues of, of waterfronts. Uh, it's done in, in many different ways. And I run, finally, I, I run a fairly high, highly structured studio. 
uh, I believe that pacing is really important. And in order to get through all the steps, it's a very long and rigorous process from programming all the way to tectonic design and communications that we, uh, I can't, okay. Well, I didn't start right at 12. Okay. So uh, I think that uh, it's important to, uh, to note that, that there is a structured process behind it. People aren't just you know, doing their own thing at their own uh, pace. Uh, a project I just want to look at very briefly, a uh, former student uh, a couple of years ago who did a project. This is the kind of research I like to see. Uh, he was interested in doing a project on renewable energy, and we were working in the industrial waterfront of San Francisco, uh, of uh, Portland, I'm sorry. Uh, he um, really looked at the use of renewable energies in the Northwest, looked at the availability, he looked at the Columbia River all the way up to Canada, and looked at the opportunities to produce uh, renewable energy in a more, uh, you might say, environmentally responsible way than we do now with the big dams. And uh, simultaneously, he looked at uh, a company uh, that produces these low-velocity um, uh, water turbines and uh, was able to match his project by uh, he's designing an industrial facility uh, that for a real company that exists in Texas and uses these on the Mississippi River, uh, making these in Portland, did a beautiful job in design of this industrial facility that produces the, uh, the generators. And uh, we take this all through, uh, you know, after multiple design studies, uh, take this all, th all the way through, very detailed uh, tectonic, uh, design, uh, interiors, that got in uh, the presentation by mistake. And uh, uh, finally, environmental restoration of this uh, brownfield site. So that is the, the kind of process that I encourage. And again, I think the process is really important. Very briefly, the three Chosen project areas are uh, Portland, uh, which has a lot going on right now. The whole Willamette River plan is being developed uh, in three stages, three north, uh, north reach, central reach, south reach. Central city plan is going on. We're going to be collaborating with the Office of Healthy Working Rivers of the city of Portland, uh, which we've done before. Uh, City has already op, uh, identified opportunity areas and sites. We're not going to be limited to these. This will be up to the students to choose sites. Uh, the St. John's area is opportune as well as downtown Portland. I'm going to have to go through these pretty quick in, in uh, the interest of time. Another opportunity area is uh, Pier 70 in San Francisco, which is... Uh, an old industrial area right here, just about a mile south of downtown. Uh, I've been actually kind of following this for several years. Uh, it's the oldest his, oldest industrial district in San Francisco and the oldest continue, continuously operating shipyard in the United States. It's an area of, you might say, derelict buildings, but some of them are historically important. It's a great opportunity. Uh, to develop, and the city finally is uh, paying some attention and in initiating uh, development. Uh, the s s last of the three uh, areas is the Brooklyn waterfront. Brooklyn is kind of uh, equivalent to our east side, only about 100 times larger. Uh, many of you know the history of it. Uh, as, as an industrial district uh, or industrial segment of the city. Uh, there are lots of opportunities uh, for new industry, uh, housing, uh, commerce, and uh, public demands on uh, recreation, uh, which have been emerging. This is the, actually the other side 
Uh, New York just released uh, a new plan for the East River Blue Way. I'm not really focusing on this area, but it is an opportunity if some students are interested, there are some sites. What this slide shows, I think, is that the public interest in waterfronts in, in dense cities is intense. And the politicians who are finally like getting involved. And um, you see multiple pressures on waterfronts. Uh, communities wanting recreation and water access. Industry wanting a place to thrive. Um, people wanting places to live. And so waterfronts have uh, multiple demands upon them. And that, uh, I've been given the time signal. And that becomes, um, you know, a, an important part of all of this. So there are precedents around the world, cities like uh, Barcelona, uh, Oslo, uh, Genoa, Seattle, who have done, uh, have done great work. And that's what I hope we will accomplish. I think that's my last one. Sorry I had to rush at the end. But that's it. I w uh, one, one final thing. Uh, I have a written, uh, a longer written uh, narrative of this, and uh, it will be posted online on Monday. So, and, and feel free, if, uh, I encourage people to contact me and uh, if they have any questions or want to talk about their interests. Thanks. Oh, I guess Jay, thank you very much for explaining what a, a thesis studio is compared to a terminal studio because I'm doing something very similar uh, with individual projects and with a little thesis. And uh, uh, since we have a timekeeper here, I think I have to be rather fast. Uh, the main topic of my studio is called Regenerative Design. And the uh, subtitle of it is called Redesigning and Rebuilding Cities, Towns, Neighborhoods, Streets, Buildings, and Gardens Destroyed by Natural Disaster and or Catastrophic Human Failure. Can I do it now? Okay. Uh, this is my, my theory uh, slide, if you want. Uh, the notion of regenerative design uh, is a notion that is used by different people in different ways. Uh, one of the more well-known definitions is the one by, that comes from John Tillman Lyle uh, from his book Gen uh, Regenerative Design for Sustainable Development, and it says something like regenerative design is a process-oriented systems theory-based approach to design. The term regenerative describes processes that restore, renew, or revitalize their own sources of energy and materials, creating sustainable systems that integrate the needs of society with the integrity of nature. The basis is derived from systems ecology. So that's a very narrow definition, if you want. So I use more the second definition, which is a broader based definition. Generative or regenerative design is an applied form of generative science that tries to understand and conceptualize the world and its complex structure as a generative or regenerative process. Generative design attempts to formulate limited parameters, principles, and rules that interact with each other to create richness of life and behavior and endless variation of form, shape, and place. Here, generative and regenerative design are more closely together because that, I believe, is more easy to, uh, to work with in terms of architecture in particular. And uh, you have a few people who are relevant uh, uh, at the bottom, some sources, uh, Chris Alexander with The Nature of Order, William McDonough and Michael Baumgart from Cradle to Cradle, which was actually taken from another person uh, whose name is Walter Starhell from Switzerland, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, so there are lots of sources, of course, for this kind of design and process. Now, you can, of course, apply regenerative design in many different situations, obviously. Uh, in our case, we apply it for disaster areas because that's where it's highly appropriate. And that's why the subtitle is very long but also very descriptive, Redesigning and Rebuilding Cities, Towns, Neighborhoods, Streets, Buildings and Gardens Destroyed by Natural Disaster and or Catastrophic Human Failure. It's a mouthful. More short, Regen of the Design in Disaster Areas. Um, now when we get into the issue of disaster areas themselves, here's a very nice uh, description of the role of the architect within that. This is coming from a symposium on housing 
a disaster of resilience by ACSA into the fall of 2011. When disaster strikes, we are all aware of it immediately as the media is quick to convey human suffering and chaos, but after initial attention subsides, the arduous efforts by people from and beyond the region to years of recovery go less noticed during a time when people are still vulnerable to public health and societal risk that can have permanent and transformative consequences. Architects and builders are part of the wave of the second responders, that's what it's called, workers who help communities reestablish and heal their internal social, economic, infrastructural, and political structures after crisis. I started to get very interested in uh, region of design uh, after the big tsunami destruction in Japan two years ago. Before, I was much more interested in generative design as such, and I still am, but that's when I really got into that because I have a very close relationship to Japan. As you can see in the second slide, uh, my wife is Japanese, and I was very concerned about uh, uh, Japan at that point because I saw for the first time in my life on TV screen how actually the disaster was happening right in front of me. I could not believe that. That was the first for me uh, to even see that, uh, that kind of event. And I was deeply shocked, I must say. So I uh, did a few actions here, like writing an article to asking for help in the German newspaper and so on. And the disaster was just incredible. This is another uh, uh, picture of this disaster in Kesenuma. Ships, whole ships, are sitting in the middle of towns. And it was uh, deeply moving. My colleague Masami Kobayashi gave a lecture a few weeks later here. Uh, and uh, I can tell you no, no face was uh, uh, dry. Everybody was crying, obviously, and it was totally quiet. I never have seen a, a, a room full of people so quiet when he described and showed the disaster. But disaster is not uh, uh, limited to uh, Japan. Obviously, it's, it's happening all over the world. This is one of our own more famous disasters, and also you see the rebuilding at the same time of Ground Zero in New York, and that's already 12 years ago, and uh, uh, that is, of course, a very famous example of regenerative design, if you want. Uh, another example is, uh, of course, New Orleans with the destruction by Hurricane Katrina. And uh, when you look at these pictures, they look so wonderful of this hurricane. Aesthetics is incredible. At the same time, there's this unbelievable destructive power. Um, and uh, when you go further back to uh, go to the city of San Francisco, you see the great earthquake in 1906 here depicted in the other, pic other picture. And then at the lower pictures, you see the uh, uh, 1989 earthquake, La Loma Prieta, that I experienced myself. That was quite scary in itself. Uh, and uh, lots of infrastructure was destroyed, uh, freeways and uh, bridges, as you can see. And now the, uh, the Bay Area Bridge is being rebuilt already. And uh, uh, to the left, you see uh, actually what's happening right now. This is a picture I took just a few days ago. This is the old bridge, and this is a new bridge building right around it and then going over the, over the uh, island, <coughs> Treasure Island, to San Francisco. Another, of course, water can have lots of uh, 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 disaster um, creation. This is the example of the Mississippi River. That's always an issue. And here we have seen our wonderful earth, beautiful, with a hurricane on top. And that is Hurricane Sandy uh, in October of 2012, not long time ago, um, having this incredible destructive power. And then you see the results of this power and people trying to come to grips with this uh, uh, incredible, terrifying events. And then only a few days ago, we had the tornado disaster in Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, these are more natural disasters. But here you see a, man, a catastrophic man-made disaster where uh, in Bangladesh, in a big factory where thousands of people were working, uh, the building started to collapse. And 1,000 pe people died only because the owners didn't want to open the, the exit doors. 1,000 um, people died. But then you have uh, little miracles here, like uh, uh, this woman, uh, Reshma, she was rescued after 17 days being in the rubble of this uh, Rana Plaza building. Um, and uh, that gives you a little bit of hope. So the question is, what can you do in, in such very uh, uh, difficult situations? Well, as this little uh, sculpture says, I think this is from New Jersey, 
uh, you have to uh, still believe, you have to pray. If you want, it doesn't say pray, but it says rebuild also. You have to rebuild, obviously. And uh, so what can you do yourself? What can you contribute to this? Um, as it says, you could uh, uh, work in design on all kinds of projects in urban design, urban building design and reurbanization, city centers and districts, housing, neighborhoods, street buildings and urban landscapes. And with regard to buildings, you can uh, work on memorials, hospitals, shelters, mixed-use buildings, city halls, civil buildings, schools, urban infrastructure, production buildings, and so on. So there's an endless range of possibilities. We have already talked about this case. Um, here's another case in Germany, the Reichstag, that was uh, uh, terribly destroyed. It was a ruin after the war, and that's how I got to know it. But then uh, 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 at some point, Christo was permitted to actually wrap it as a piece of art that you can see in the top right corner. And then finally, uh, uh, it was uh, then rebuilt, redesigned by uh, Norman Foster Associates, and then it became what it is today, a very modern, uh, uh, extremely fancy kind of parliament, which it is, of course, in Germany. It is the German parliament building. Um, you also can uh, design memorials. To the left, you see the Oklahoma Memorial based on the 1995 homemade terrorist bombing. And to the, thank you. And to the right side, you see the Holocaust uh, Memorial by Peter Eisenmann in the middle of Berlin. And at the back, you see some of the Plattenbauten from the old East German uh, construction industry. Uh, you can also develop a children's hospital, as Linnea O'Dowd did here for Mexico City. Or you can uh, uh, redesign a, cons a production building that uh, then can be used for new production again, as in this case here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let's uh, uh, get back to the very basic purpose of this design studio. Forget about regenerative design. Just think about this human side of, of what this is all about. The main purpose of the studio is to help others through one own, one's own passion and expertise contribute to the re-establishment, redesign, and rebuilding of disaster areas and buildings in their different contexts. Most of all, it is essential to help people and communities to find and create life again in what I call a creation production process. These are pictures from Haiti, and many of our uh, colleagues and friends and students have done work in Haiti. Um, I'm, I want to contribute to this effort this summer with the... Uh, uh, workshop in the Fukushima region. It's a little bit dangerous uh, there because of the uh, nuclear disaster and the, uh, and the difficulties uh, that we have still there. But I, I, I will uh, work together with the Japanese AIA and the and Meiji University in trying to uh, help one of the regions that are affected by uh, these events in Japan. Um, do I have a few more seconds? I just want to show you a few little... Uh, a few projects uh, that uh, uh, my students did in 2011, 2012. Uh, you see here the uh, uh, 18 students who were working on this. And uh, uh, I think I have a few examples here. They, oh, their work was uh, exhibited in uh, uh, the Oregon Design Conference and presented there in the spring of 2012. I think you remember that uh, when you were there. And uh, it was also uh, presented in, uh, in uh, the city of Ishinomaki in uh, and it's still exhibited there in, in uh, Japan, and it was also exhibited at the Mercy Corps when they had a symposium there in March of 2012. Let me just uh, show you a few examples here what the students did. Can you, yeah, it's still visible. This is, uh, uh, the title is Fury and Fragility. It's, uh, it's uh, a work by Nadia Kasko in Ishinomaki in Japan, one of the destroyed cities there. And uh, this, on the first page of this report, you see the urban effort, and on the second page, you see the architectural effort, because what we do here in uh, Portland is urban architecture, which means you deal with one urban aspect and then with the architectural aspect, as you all know. And the architectural aspect was the wastewater treatment facility within that urban project. This is another project in Japan by Sarah uh, rutzon berka It's called Rising Landscape. I can, you can read it yourself. Uh, this is the urban, urban structures that she developed around a, a ballpark. That's why it's all around here. And you can see her architectural project is a ballpark, a round ballpark, that has an effect on the 
urban structure that she developed. Then we have, uh, uh, here is Patrick Fisher, who dealt with uh, water problems in North Dakota, the in uh, Minot, with the Souris River. This is, he tried, this is more regional plan than an urban plan, tried to find ways to control the water, and then he came up with the within a, an, an urban building, a research center for dealing with water issues. Uh, of course, somebody had to deal with, uh, with uh, New Orleans. This is uh, uh, Junior Caballal. His project is called From Resistance to Resilience, Water, People, and Places. This is his uh, urban design project along the river. And then, and then this is the, the actual architectural project. Uh, then we have uh, Emily Steen. Her project is called Living with Water, and she was dealing with the rising, with the possibility of the rising waters in the Netherlands that already has problems with water and uh, how to deal uh, with uh, a problem there of that kind. And uh, this is her, her project of a station that actually can rise and fall with, uh, with, the, with the water. Uh, this is a project called And Living by uh, um, Julian Potter. It deals with the tornado uh, problems in uh, uh, Joplin, uh, Missouri, and you can see the tornado path right through there. And this is where I put this project there. And he went there. Most of the students uh, who do this project, they have to go to the site uh, and actually know the site because otherwise you couldn't really do that. There are very few that, uh, that actually can convince me not to know the site, but that may be only one or two. I think I'm getting the sign from uh, Nancy that I should finish up here, so then let me just go to the last page here. Because I just at least want to show you the two questions that the uh, students were asking at the end. Well, this is apparently not. Well, this is one project. This is actually a prevention a project uh, uh, in the Earthquake Prevention Center in Portland. But we want to get to the last page here. Sorry. So students were asking many questions, but uh, I just want to read two questions so uh, that. I don't know have the answer to that. Uh, is the world coming to an overall more disaster state of affairs in which environmental and social problems influence more and more of our lives in a negative way? I think that was an important question. And then the last question here, why are students both motivated and willing to attempt to solve some of these apparent and urgent problems? Uh, I, I have no answer to that, but uh, those are the questions they were asking. So thank, thank you. you. Okay. Hello, everybody here in Portland. Can everybody in Eugene hear me as well? Put your, put your thumb up if you can hear me. Great. Must have some contact there. So, um, Judith, thank you for the introduction. I'm Becca Cavell. I am a principal with THA Architecture here in Portland. Um, and I'm very excited to be asked to teach a thesis or terminal or comprehensive studio, whatever we want to call it. Um, so, um, Hayo, uh, you are doing a, a thesis studio. Um, I'll be doing a comprehensive studio um, which does have a defined site and does not have a defined program but has program parameters. Um, I've got, pulled together a flyer. Is this distributed already, Nancy, or um, do we know? Do we have this? So, um, it's, well, I just have one. <laughs> but I guess it'll get posted or I can send more out. I also have um, cards here for students who are in Portland. If you want to contact me, I, I have business cards. People down in Eugene, um, you can um, find my email contact very easily um, through the THA website, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but the studio that we're, we're offering is a THA studio. I'll be the, the prime instructor, but we'll be joined by a second THA uh, uh, staff member. We're going to identify that person um, in a couple of months. Uh, once our date for studio starts. Now, um, we will be teaching a, a seminar as well. I believe that um, the, the thesis studios are also teaching seminars, correct? Now, yours are three credit sem uh, seminars, is that right? The, the THA seminar is a one credit seminar, and that reflects uh, that we are giving more definition to the studio, so there's less individual research that's necessary by the individual students, but there is some, and that's described in more detail in that flyer. 
Um, the site is in Portland. It's the uh, block to the immediate north of the two-block Portland Art Museum development. Um, and so this is an aerial. Um, you will see our site. I'm going to have a series of overlays here. Um, the site is this uh, full city block in Portland. Our blocks are 200 square feet, or 200 by 200 feet, um, a one-acre lot. You can see two buildings on that site, um, and we'll come back to those in just a minute. But it is, if you would like the full development of this block to its maximum potential uh, through a dense urban mixed-use development. This is the uh, Masonic Temple, which was redeveloped by Portland Art Museum several years ago, working with Anne Bihar. And uh, this uh, purple dot, which hopefully everybody in Eugene can see as well, is the current Portland Art Museum, which is a beautiful uh, mid-century building designed, probably uh, Pietro Belusky's first uh, civic piece of architecture. Uh, we have other interesting buildings around us. The Elliott by uh, ZGF and Ankara Moisen, a lovely, in my opinion, um, urban uh, residential development, fairly high density, fairly high end. Uh, we have Museum Place, which is a more uh, mid-range um, urban development, mixed use and housing by GBD Architects. The Roosevelt Hotel, we're back on our site now. The Roosevelt Hotel is a beautiful historic building that is uh, in private residential ownership right now. Um, you are welcome to leave it as it is to destroy it or to reuse it in some way. I want you to propose what you want to do with it. And um, we have the Northwest Film School, a fairly unimposing building, but a very interesting use on the site. So, oh, oh and we have, let's not forget, the park blocks, a very important piece of um, urban uh, development of the traditional uh, uh, city uh, development here in Portland, um, and a fascinating part of a more broad urban study. Uh, we will be asking you to look at the broad urban context in some detail, as well as the redevelopment of this entire block in great detail. So some photographs of the site. Let's see if my little mouse will work here. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's too, too weighty. So on the left-hand side, that is the Pietro Belusky Portland Art Museum. In the middle, the uh, very interesting um, uh, uh, public realm, sculpture courtyard that is between the art museum and the Masonic temple. And on the right-hand side, you see a, a photograph of the Masonic with the Ambiha kind of glass lid, which I think was completely ripped off from the Herzog de Murin uh, Tate Modern London project, but it still works quite well on the Masonic temple. So if it works one place, I guess try it somewhere else. Um, and then we have our site. You can see there's some significant grade change on this site. Um, it's a very urban context. This is looking from the northwest corner. So you can see the Masonic in the background there on the right-hand side. And we're looking right at the film school. Um, so I would be interested in knowing if you would want to reincorporate the film school into this project in some way. Looking at the site from, uh, this is, the, again, the, port, the uh, Masonic temple to the immediate right. So this is looking from the southwest corner of the property. And uh, mostly it's a parking lot, so it's kind of up for grabs. Somebody told me that this uh, site was offered for studio in Eugene a couple of years ago for an urban mausoleum, which I think is a <laughs> pretty interesting use of the site. And this is the Roosevelt Hotel, which per personally I think is beautiful. Um, so if you want to tear this building down, you have to have a very, very compelling argument as to why you might do that. Um, its incorporation into a full block development, I think, is a more interesting challenge, whether you repurpose it or you allow it to remain exactly as it is and in its current ownership. So this is something that you need to consider in that first term. Now, what are we going to put into this entire block development? Well, uh, once you've figured out how big your development can be, and it will be pretty darn big on this site in Portland, and you can probably do some trade-offs with some other projects and get some air rights to make it even bigger than the city plan might allow... I have five minutes left. Um, we, you might want to put in some uh, program relationships to do with the art museum. You may want exhibit spaces. You may want um, um, art creation spaces. You may want to have art selling spaces. I would encourage you to consider food. Portland's a wonderful food capital, so you might want to look at Portland's wonderful tradition of food carts, integrate that in some way. There are wonderful micro-restaurants popping up as a direct sort of uh, evolution of the food cart. You might want to do a high-end uh, restaurant of some kind. You might want to do uh, voodoo donuts. Uh, you, I would encourage you to introduce an educational component to this building. That is something that I'm very interested in personally. I think it's a perfect site to do some kind of educational component. We do have that film school. We can uh, riff on that. 
Um, and housing is a required component. So you are required to do mixed use. You are required to do housing. Now, that housing could range from the highest end condominiums you care to do to micro housing, which is a very interesting movement um, globally and in Portland. Uh, units are getting increasingly small. And you may want to consider a homeless shelter of some kind. I want you to posit what you think is the appropriate use of this site in this city in our culture today. Now, moving on quickly to THA architecture, because this is a, a, a firm-led studio, um, we uh, will bring another uh, individual to co-teach with me. We will also bring uh, as many people as we can from our office to review um, and to, to work in workshop uh, scenarios with you. We've done this successfully a couple of times in the past already. THA is led by uh, Thomas Hacker, uh, who founded the practice 30 years ago. He used to teach down in Eugene, um, and we are uh, a 35-person strong firm with a strong tradition in regional, uh, regionally appropriate design and craft. I show you these slides because I want you to know who you'll be working with, the people who make buildings like this, the people that you will be working with. We will also bring in our consultants, so structural engineers, landscape designers, and so on, in workshop settings as we move into the second of the two studio terms, and you really are having to dig deep into the, uh, the, the meaningful creation of, of, of a tectonic form of some kind. Um, so just quickly reviewing our work, the previous slide was the a Discovery Center in the Gorge, this building that the students in Eugene will know is right across from us, it's Mercy Corps. Um, the Cyan building is very close to the site that we're proposing for the studio. This is a, a, a um, fairly compact housing, mixed-use housing project. Um, we have the Oregon Military Department Readiness Center was recently opened in Dallas, Oregon a Bayview Library project, and finally, um, a proposal for uh, Downstream um, by Corey Martin, who is our newest design principal. He was a, co a founder of Path Architects, and we had the pleasure of recruiting him to THA, and he's one of our design leaders now. Um, and so this just gives you a flavor of the direction that the firm is heading as we move into the, the next, uh, next 10 years of our life, um, and we'd love to have uh, students from Eugene and students from Portland join us. Okay, we're done here in Portland. Thank you very much. Your turn. Hi, good afternoon. Um, <laughs> you want to turn that light off? Yeah, I don't. <clears throat> Can't turn those down because they're filming a little bit. Um, I'm Michael Feifel, obviously, and um, give you a little background. Um, Peter Keese and I sort of um, co direct the housing focus within the Department of Architecture, and we uh, have worked out a system of uh, alternating every year with a housing terminal studio. So this year, um, Peter's teaching one. Next year, I'll be teaching it. And we, I'm, I have to apologize really a little bit for this because just in the last day, I had a um, change um, based on a wonderful discussion I had with VAR Architects down in San Francisco. And they're going to, um, they're going to sponsor the studio essentially. So it's going to be able to provide not only some financial assistance, but it's also going to be able to provide um, a lot of consulting with them. And so it's what I have listed here, I'm going to have to um, change just a little bit. In the past, I've always allowed students to 
uh, choose their own project and their own site. And in some cases, that's worked out wonderfully. And I'll show you some, some individual projects that were done in my last terminal studio a year ago that were really, really good. And they're, they're, they vary all over the place in terms of location and what, they, what they're doing, but they all have a housing focus of one type or another. Um, uh, this time, I'm going to uh, have a little bit more of a structure to the issues that we're going to address so it's not all over the place. In the, in the past, I've had high rises and I've had low rises. The intent is that it's a comprehensive studio. So in the past, if there was something where somebody did something that was uh, not quite as big of a project, they had to go into a lot more detail. And in some cases, it's actually doing construction documents for the project. This particular focus, and you may have seen it, I revised online and on the board um, outside of the architecture building, um, the one-page description. And it's almost the exact same thing, but there's a little bit more of a focus on looking at um, alternatives to what traditional housing and apartments are today in the typical sort of two- or three-bedroom apartment. What BAR is really interested in, and they have a lot of clients and a lot of um, individuals, especially in San Francisco, where it's very, very expensive uh, to, to buy into a housing market. They're really interested in looking at not only sort of micro housing, but looking at a little bit more um, sort of regular size units, but with a great deal of flex flexibility in the unit design. And one of the things they've found is that they've got a number of individuals coming to them that are actually saying to them, I don't want any windows in my bedroom because I want to be able to come and go to sleep right away. And that's actually something that surprised me because I've always been somebody that's always thought that air and ventilation, no matter what the code say, is something that you have to have. So there's a whole sort of set of ways of thinking about things that are going to probably challenge traditional ways of doing things. But one of the things that I've always um, talked with my housing students about is that if you can design a room and not put a label on it, and you can look at that and say, that could be a really good bedroom, that could be a study, that could be a home office, that could be something else, and it could satisfy all of those, then to me it's a really good design. And that's something that I'm extremely um, interested in. Um, so the first half of the winter term is going to be um, really sort of analyzing, uh, developing a process, develop, developing principles of what is going to make up good housing. And then individuals will have the ability to choose their site and choose the program that they want. David, is pro David Israel Barr is probably going to be able to um, provide a site and some ideas. And if you want to plug into that, you're more than welcome to. I want to still give flexibility enough that you can design whatever you want to do within a certain framework. I know there are a lot of people that are interested in affordable housing. The challenge with affordable housing is that uh, much of the uh, funding sources for that are based on more traditional types of ways of thinking about it. So you get funded by the number of bedrooms. So in my case, where I'm thinking about challenging what a tr just traditional bedroom might be, that doesn't work into affordable housing very well. So part of the idea here is to try to make an argument of why this type of design could be something that could apply not only to market rate housing, but also to affordable housing. There's also the opportunity of having mixed-use buildings, so especially on the ground floor where there might be retailers. Uh, so it's really still pretty wide open, but the idea is to challenge what is the traditional, and that's, that's the main, uh, main focus of the studio. Um, there isn't a separate um, class like many of the studios, especially up in Portland, the thesis studios, that they have a programming class in the, in the fall. What I do is... Uh, I'll be teaching my housing prototypes class in the fall, and that's an opportunity for students that are in the terminal studio to take the housing prototypes class, and they can fulfill um, that housing prototypes class by doing precedent studies and programming of what they're really interested in through the projects that are required for the housing prototypes class. For those of you that may have already taken that class or can't take it, or have taken you know, Peter's housing design and maybe... Uh, like Pyatt talks affordable housing class, and this just doesn't fit into your schedule. Um, there's an opportunity for independent study work that I'd be more than happy to sponsor so that you can do a little bit of research prior to the beginning of the studio. Um, something that it, I, I put this together uh, a few days ago, and I didn't get an opportunity after this conversation yesterday to change it. One thing that's missing on here is um, 
winter term, I'll be teaching my minimal dwelling class. And that actually fits in really, really well with what the studio, the terminal studio is going to be. So there might be an opportunity for you to take not only the housing prototypes class to do the programming and understand precedence, but then winter term do the minimal dwelling. And some aspects of that would apply to whatever project you might be doing. Um, we'll have a fall term meeting at some point where we get to know each other and talk about what the specific projects are. And I think that'll be uh, useful. Um, then we'll do a field trip um, sometime. Uh, I usually do it the week before classes start in the winter. Um, we're kind of the calendar this year. It's going to be a little, a little weird than that. Uh, we start on the sixth of January, and if you back that up to go in on Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday, you're right at the beginning of the new year. And that's probably not going to work in terms of your schedule, but also the people that we want to go see and visit while we're down there. So that's uh, we'll have to take a look at that. Um, I want basically um, when I wrote this, I, I was thinking everybody was going to do an individually um, individual project, and I wanted the programming complete prior to the beginning of studio. It's a little bit of leeway now that we're going to be doing things in, in studio a little bit more. The other idea is studio consultants is something that I've done every year that I've offered uh, students in this studio the opportunity to have an outside consultant, somebody that really deals with housing. Um, I've had people um, at uh, Lake Plato's office last year. We've had uh, a Miller Hole in the past. Um, we, uh, Jonathan Siegel in San Diego was a consultant. We've had a number of people, and they've, uh, they've worked really, really well with the students. I also get a lot, a lot of local professionals. Reviews tend to have more reviewers than students because there are a lot of people that there are some connections that I have through the AIA. I'm able to bring them in, and that's worked out really, really well. Um, DAR this time is not is going to, in addition to the, the regular consultants I have, they're going to also be able to um, provide their own consultants and uh, mentors, and they'll also be coming up to uh, Eugene to give presentations and to review. So that you know that's going to be very useful. Um, should note that those students that pick consultants and work closely with them tend to get jobs in those offices. Um, that's of any interest to you. And um, uh, winter term expectations, uh, I'll show you an example. And then we always do some form of a final brochure. You may have been in and seen that the accreditation uh, exhibit some, some of the projects and that were out of my studio. Uh, this is a book, uh, one student project. It has all the technical details of structure, mechanical systems, everything in it that you would expect in a comprehensive studio. And so that's sort of the expectation that during the uh, spring term you get to that level. Um, I've got a number of examples up here that I'll leave, and you can come and uh, look at those. But let me just real quickly, in a short amount of time, uh, tell you a little bit about things. This is a field trip. Uh, the field trip to San Francisco, we go when we go to offices, and we go uh, visit um, housing sites. So David Baker gave us a tour. We went to his office, but he also gave us a tour of the Curran Building, which is a affordable housing uh, project. Uh, we usually go to Barr. We go to um, Bill Letty's office. Uh, we go to um, Methune's San Francisco office. We do it. Many of them, David Baker's not a graduate of Oregon, but all the others, the principals, are, are graduates of, of the University of Oregon. They've been very generous with their time. We go to some other offices. Um, uh, went to Anderson and Anderson to look at some of uh, you know, the tech tectonic aspects of what they're doing, and very interesting office in terms of what, this is when you walk in the front door, you walk through the shop before you get to their actual office. And so the craft is something, of making is something that I'm really interested in. Um, I, I really appreciate digital rendering, but I think um, I've seen so many student projects that lack content, and they sort of disguised with digital rendering that I'm really interested in the craft of making. And so um, there's a real emphasis on appropriateness for that. We go and we look at a number of projects. This is um, Stanley Sadowitz's uh, Yerba Vena project. Um, my roommate from college owns a unit in this, so we get to have an opportunity to go there. Um, we have some dinners in San Francisco and seem to have some fun. Um, these projects are ones that have been done in the past. Uh, Brent's project from five years ago, uh, undergraduate uh, in the Honors College, um, just won the President's Award in the Honors College. 
that was probably um, one of the, the best student projects that I've, I've had the privilege of seeing over the years. And just, the, just a really, really good project of looking at issues of homelessness in different I, uh, transitions between homelessness to more permanent housing. Um, Brent's been uh, traveling, but also working for Mark Gillum for the last few years and uh, just got accepted to Yale for graduate school. Just give you an idea of some of the, the ideas that he does. And of course, he draws better than just about anybody. So. Um, and model making, again, is something that we really address. Um, some other examples from um, three years ago. This is where uh, students had a real uh, freedom to do whatever they wanted. A uh, couple uh, option three students and a undergraduate student. And so I get a variety of undergraduates and graduates. Um, this is a midterm review, and so the expectation uh, was pretty great at the, well, I should say at the end of the winter term, so the, at the end of the first term, and then that same student coming back to do her final project. Um, and you'll see that's the book down there that has all the, uh, the technical information in it. Um, Undergraduate Sam doing uh, a little bit more of a low rise uh, series of pro uh, projects that was really well uh, received. Jamie, uh, both Sam got a job with Banker Moisen, which is one of his consultants. Um, Jamie got a, a job with her consultant, which was in an office in Sacramento where she wanted to be. And she did an affordable housing project with a, a number of uh, different user types within it. Uh, Amanda, uh, also in the Honors College, uh, did a project where she was really looking at environmental systems and had a, a committee, she had consultants including Allison Clock, and, uh, and she had outside consultants also that helped her on this one. So the intent of this was to really get into the, the detail of all the technical issues that you'd see. And then finally, uh, the, the first four ones were all projects that you may have seen in the uh, um, in our accreditation exhibit. This one I did, uh, we didn't put in there because it was you know, a little hard to get all this stuff back again, but, um, but Kate uh, was an option two student who uh, did, uh, did a project in Memphis with a consultant there and they got a job in that office. And so she was looking at an infill site. This just gives you an indication of some of the areas of the investigation in the second term that we were really getting into in terms of the tech comments of the, the project. And again, it was an infill long site, so she had to figure out a way of getting light into the interior of this. So that should be it. Um, I'm going to leave some of these uh, uh, brochures up here. We do, uh, we also do a um, summary of all the student projects, and so all the students provide me with information on that. And uh, Thank you. Right. Hi, everyone. And uh, I know that probably all of you know me from ECS too, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, not, not many of you have taken studios with me. And um, one of the things that um, my studios always have is that they are real projects. Um, uh, I always teach studios where we, it's a real project that's happening whether in Eugene or in Portland or California somewhere. Um, and we usually are collaborating 
um, in the process of making uh, that studio happen or that project happen and typically got some funding based on that and uh, for two ways. First, to help support us to get to field trips and other things like that. But secondly, um, we take in the work in a way that we're doing and we analyze it and we develop uh, reports, research reports back to the design firm or to the owner or the client that help them either make sure that that project is going to happen or can let them think about other ways uh, of maybe uh, adjusting their gear. Um, and um, uh, one of the issues is that um, that project especially was, was I think, um, a great project. It's the, the Portland Centennial Mills. And um, I've been teaching um, thermal studios for as long as I was here. And then I took uh, around three years hiatus from it um, just to do something else. And when that project came, when the, when the phone rang for that project, I kind of felt that I really have to do that. I mean, it, it was so exciting to me. Um, also knowing that project from before, from another investigation in 2005 that didn't pencil out. Um, and um, um, it was a very great opportunity to actually get in and do something regarding that. And um, I don't know if you, many of you know that project or know the Centennial Mills. Let me put here the... I don't need that. Um, how many of you, what is this? <laughs> okay. How many of you have been close to Centennial Mills in Portland? How many of you know the Pearl District in Portland? Okay, so that's at the edge of the Pearl District. Really, I mean, that's kind of, if you look at the Pearl District and you think about the waterfront of Portland, that's the waterfront of the Pearl District. And, um, um, you know, the, the site or the history of the site has um, a very interesting dimension. This, the Centennial Mills used to be in the heydays, in its heydays in 1910, used to be really the catalyst um, for um, all the kind of the, um, uh, the waterfront um, commercial engagement. This was the mills where it was, used to be a flour mill, uh, where it was kind of really the, uh, the central part of the commercial central part of the waterfront. Um, it expanded. It was really the, the bigger thing or the biggest thing on the waterfront that was happening in Portland. Um, after a number of years um, in decline, um, Portland, uh, the Portland Development Commission uh, thought about this is the last opportunity for Portland to have a place on the waterfront. Um, you, you certainly know the, the park on the waterfront front, uh, close to downtown Portland. This is just a park on the waterfront to get you to the waterfront, but it's not a place where people go to. It's not a destination as much as a kind of a transitional area where maybe festivals happen, bikers go through, uh, joggers, etc. But a place on the waterfront, this was the last kind of point that Portland would have an actual place of happening on the waterfront. Um, one of the things that uh, since Portland or the Portland Development Commission purchased that site from the mills that was still in active production until 2000, until the year 2000, when uh, Portland Development Commission purchased that site um, with eyeing that this would be the development site for the, for the Portland waterfront, basically, uh, or place on the waterfront, um, they were under the impression that uh, that site or many of the buildings would be in good conditions, that they can easily transfer them into adaptive reuse, they can maybe do some housing, stuff like that. And um, around 2004, the, well, after they purchased the site and they do due diligence, they found out that many of the buildings are actually falling down. And, <laughs> and the, the, the recommendation of the consultants that do that, that, that typically happens, right? You hire that engineering environmental analysis firm and then they find a little bit of carcinogenic here and said that building has to be completely blown away. It's so dangerous to human occupation. And uh, that kind of was the result of that report, that they kind of find everything that was slightly potentially dangerous. And they said that the, the best thing that you can do is just like bump that site out uh, and, uh, and uh, make it vacant and then do something from scratch. Um, the architecture community and the uh, 
and um, I think the preservationist and actually the whole Portland um, um, got really alarmed by that report and uh, they uh, created the resolution actually city mandate that um, that that site um, that kind of that, that report would be scratched that a, develop, a real kind of development a real process need to happen that also has to engage both the public and private entities um, and the, the part of that mandate is that that site would be preserved or some parts, big portions of it would be preserved and um, it will be, you know, kind of it's a valuable artifact again of the industrial working waterfront and the resolution directed PDC and the Bureau of Land to work with interested stakeholders to develop a comprehensive plan for um, the redevelopment, recycling um, and reuse of the site. Um, and this is kind of just gives you a history of the site. Um, Around, um, after that resolution, um, there was a bid for develop teams of developers, architects, consultants um, together, uh, and one winning team from California with a, with a developer from actually Russia um, <laughs> kind of won the bid to do the site. Um, they went in, um, and soon enough, um, they're, they're kind of most of their plans or most of what's coming out of that was a more of a designification effort. It was a very California type of proposal, um, you know, like, um, you know, kind of not really a place for Portland. It was a very much of a place where you go in and you have a Disney-like impression. Maybe you can do a ride inside of the mills or something. Um, but it was very catch. It was very um, not very appropriate. It was also very lush in terms of its, um, um, in terms of, you know, the housing that was proposed there was very high-end housing. Some housing was proposed there, um, as well as restaurants, high-end restaurants. It was all this kind of culinary experience. So that um, didn't work very much. There was a big lawsuit that got settled in 2012, and um, PDC um, started kind of looking for a developer, for a team of developer architect where they can actually make that a place. And that's a very important thing. You know, it's from just developing it for the sake of um, just turning the most, the most profit out of it to developing it to make it a place in the city. And um, uh, part of this, and if you go in and Google, um, you know, Centennial Mills, you'll find tons of things written on it. Um, it's, a, it's a very, it's, a, it's not only an exciting place, you know, if you go and visit it, you'll be alarmed by how beautiful some of these industrial uh, buildings are of the turn of the century, but also regarding how political it was, the, the issues around it, um, the, the interest of uh, Portlandians and, or Portland to actually have a real place on the waterfront where people can go um, and, and spend time to have a public interest, private interest, uh, all these things coming together. So finally, uh, the developer whose harsh, uh, who's, um, harsh investment properties, um, if you know something about them, this is the Jordan Schnitzer. Mr. Schnitzer is the big boss in Harsh. And he is the one that's funding us, so we have to be very nice to Mr. Schnitzer in that studio. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the, he's very excited about about that kind of basically looking at that, turning that project into the academics, you know, and kind of from the academic side and seeing what we can come up with because all the professionals looking at it, they have um, very much some kind of blinders based on the constraints of the site. Uh, so there is have some limitations to some of the things that you, they need to think about. Um, we, on the other hand, can investigate things a little bit in a little more free mode. So the combination of both of these things coming together should be a very, very interesting thing. Um, this is just some images of the site. The site is a 4.5 acres. Uh, it's a big site. Uh, it's in between the Broadway Bridge and uh, the other bridge here. This is some of the... Um, images um, um, of the size. This is the flour mill, uh, the other mills here. Um, th there's the Portland um, uh, police or the, um, uh, the um, what do you call that? The, the police on the horses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's a horse barn in here that will be probably removed. Um, but um, the idea is that that whole thing now during the summer is going through a master plan. And, and an analysis. And by the end of the summer, the master plan will be 
uh, penciled out, and there will be parcels within these projects that we know exactly what would be the best options for them. We're also engaged in that master plan, so we're kind of heavily engaged throughout the process. But for you as the studio, you're going to have a master plan with some layaway, and every one of you will develop a program based on that master plan. So this is a more of a, of a thesis studio where you really have to select what you wanted to do. It might be retail, it might be portion, there's a small portion of housing, it might be commercial activity, it might be the, um, the urban entertainment center that will be there. So there is a lot of, of mixed-use activities, mixed-use prototypes of buildings that will be uh, envisioned on that site. Each one of the Thurman Studio uh, um, students will have to craft within these guidelines of the business master plan what they really wanted to do um, part of that uh, site. Um, um, the site, um, this is the Pearl District, is, is over here. Uh, the waterfront is back here. There's a, actually train, um, a train, freight train that goes in there. So there is a big barriers between the site and the city, and that has been um, the, the concept or part of the conceptual how to address that barriers, how to bridge that barriers, and how to integrate that part uh, back to Portland. Um, there's rough areas in that building as well, and there's jewels that you need to look for. There's lots of in very interesting spaces, uh, you know, tri triple high spaces with daylight and everything, and there are spaces that are very rough and actually very unsafe for us even to go close to. Um, but uh, we, there is a lot, tons of documentation for us to, to go through. There is lots of um, analysis that has been done already um, by, by fall. Um, we, the, it will be ready for the, the vision, the main vision, the main, main image, imaging will be uh, done, and it will be part of us to start engaging. Um, one of the things, just um, zooming out, um, uh, this is the south waterfront of Portland. Here is the Pearl District, and this is our site. Um, the vision was to, for Port Portland Development Commission is really to, to make these two destination bookends and activate that whole waterfront based on that. This is the area closer downtown that will always be a park and a, a festival area or, or, or um, 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 ceremonial area. But then these are the two destinations. And this has been failing as a destination because it becomes mainly about high-end housing um, on the south waterfront. And they don't want to repeat um, that, that um, basically that, uh, that mistake again and making that the, actually the active hub for that. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quickly here. Um, some of the issues, and I think basically what you will find out or what we will come up with when you come in the fall, what you'll find out that there will be areas here and zones that will be already planned for certain uses, um, residential with a certain component, retail, uh, uh, offices, commercial, etc. cetera. And um, it will be up to you to select which, which program type which thing within this master plan that you want to craft further. It, might, it will also be up to you to select whether you want to do it part of an old building, part of a new building, part of a, of a both uh, situation. So that would be uh, some of the things in there. Um, there is ma major connections, bridging, that uh, divide way, uh, and the, the um, train and everything. Um, there is compo there is, uh, this is the residential area of the Pearl. Uh, this is a site for a potential school. So there is uh, lots of um, opportunities. You kind of have to dig through the dirt to find the jewel. Uh, this is um, the Disneyfication kind of proposal, and that was the one that was shut down. Uh, and, um, and this is, you know, we have, we have a big analysis of that report to kind of see what we should not do. Um, Portland and the, the, the whole process, the public-private process, identified five main dimensions that we need to do uh, for that project, providing open space for the public, capturing the history and the essence of the place, uh, defining a community focal points, uh, embracing sustainability, and strengthening the connection uh, through the neighborhood and the city. Um, this is some kind of artist renderings, imaging, imaging that uh, is happening that will also continue on through the summer. Um, some of the things um, that I, uh, in the process of the workflow that I expect you to be engaged with in that is a pro project. There is some kind of what I call the pre-studio, typically pre-studio seminar tasks and something in the first term and then the, the second term of the studio. Um, and um, 
there are things that are gonna still kind of continue on happening. Uh, this is a studio that has to has a thesis component. It, it mean, meaning that you have to come up with some intentions. You have to come up with some questions. Um, it's not the program is not all defined for you. There is a vision and the framework that you will work from, but you need to kind of define what it is for you and make that your your mark about it. Um, we have a master plan, but that master plan could be stretched, could be changed a little bit. There is um, a number of things that will happen in the fall here regarding the precedent analysis, the site context synthesis, the benchmarking um, for the building for sustainability and so forth. Um, and then there are other things that will continue on basically um, uh, winter and spring. Um, one of the things that I want to stress is that um, in my studios we always measure things. I'm, very, I'm a fan of measuring you know, design. Uh, so we're going to have to do simulations. We're going to have to do modeling. We have going to have to measure how things are and how our design fare close to the benchmark that we set in. So I expect that um, you'll have, we'll, we'll kind of have a number of workshops. Um, um, in a way, in, in our preparation, there is the fall seminar, which is also part of that high performance building um, uh, design and evaluation seminar. Um, I expect you, whoever is going to take the studio, to take the seminar. Um, it's not an obligation. If you, if you don't want to take it, you'll suffer. But, uh, but uh, so I, I advise you very much to take it. Uh, but um, we're going to have a precedence field trip um, in the winter break after the fall. Um, the destination is not yet determined based on what will people choose. We'll have a field trip that kind of give you precedence for what you're trying to do. Um, that might be New York, might be San Francisco. We're, we're still kind of looking at these options. Um, there's going to be a number of modeling and simulation workshops. This is, you know, we don't, there's no class that has, says you know, energy modeling or you know, CO2 modeling or life cycle analysis in a way. So these will be kind of workshops that I'll be offering through the lab, through the hype lab, uh, to the people in the studio so that they can get uh, the bearings and get the things that you, they want, they need to do uh, to get there. Um, and that will happen during the fall and winter term. Um, the la last part of the preparation is that um, I expect you to be fully engaged, you know, so maybe have a restful summer because that's going to be uh, a long ride. Um, some of the collaboration, I think, and I said, since it's a real project, we have a really great collaborators uh, for that. Uh, Jordan Schnitzer with Harsh, Portland Development Commission and their staff, um, Gil Kelly from Harsh, uh, Tad Savinar, who's an, an urban artist and had done a lot of the things in Portland regarding uh, some of these projects. Uh, Lab Architecture from California is the, uh, uh, the consultant for that project, and we have uh, the collaboration from them. Um, Hannah B. Uh, Eddy Architects from Portland are also the local the design firm, the local firm. Uh, we're going to have collaboration with them. Lori Olin, um, uh, the landscape, the famous landscape firm, uh, is the landscaper for the open and, uh, open and urban uh, spaces, and we also have collaborations for that. So these are going to be uh, more or less our consultants throughout the studio, and they're going to be uh, people that we're going to be working with. Uh, that's my final slide. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm going to take it with me. <laughs> take it with me. Yeah, thanks. How do I do this? Where's that? Got it, got it, thanks. Okay, um, so what I wanted to do with the um, Terminal Studio was to continue a couple of things. One is I wanted to continue the theme of the last couple of Terminal Studios I've been teaching, including this year and two years ago. And that theme has been the idea 
of production in the city, the notion that the city needs to be a place of production and not only consumption. And students are now doing a whole series of projects that have to do with urban agriculture, urban manufacture, and so forth. Right? I also wanted to do something which was um, uh, based on a more specific building type and a building type which is uh, somehow more figural, more public space than is suggested by the projects that I've been doing. Right? I also want to do a building. I always try to do a building that's fairly contained as a, as a total program and that's always been a kind of requirement for the studio but one where there's still choice and development on the part of the students as to what exactly that building, what exactly that building would actually be. So what I'm going to do is a project that's, um, what we're going to do is a project that's based in London, right, and that um, has to do with the theme of production and performance in the city. It's a building that's going to include a, um, uh, a place for performance of either drama, music, some other kind of performance art, and that'll be one of the things that people will actually develop the program for that and the, um, uh, and the thesis that has to do with that issue in the fall seminar. And then the development of a, of a building that includes that production idea, the idea that people from the city are actually learning how to put together a theatrical production sort of in the way that I'm dealing with uh, with my terminal studio now, but also a major room, a performance hall for music, a performance hall for theater, right? So it's combining these two issues into one, uh, one terminal, uh, terminal studio project. So the, so the project is um, uh, an architecturally complex building, and I always like to do that. I always tend to try to put a lot of different kinds of things together because I think the architectural challenge of doing that is really interesting, it's architectonically interesting, it's technically interesting, and certainly a theater has a lot of um, technical issues uh, that have to do with acoustics, that have to do with sight lines, that have to do with materials, that have to do with the back of house space, which all needs to come together in a place of public, public significance and public, uh, and public meaning, right? So I, I find buildings that are theater buildings really interesting as uh, architecture, as architecture and as, as architectural buildings. Uh, the project also does engage cultural and economic issues of artistic production in the city. And that's largely because the back of house space, the workshops, the scene shops, the lighting shops are not going to be necessarily back of, back of house, but are going to be connected to the city, connected to the street and places where uh, people who are not specialists, kids from the city, whatever, however we think about it, will be involved in the in putting together the theatrical the theatrical production. Uh, it's going to deal with local to urban design issues with respect to um, uh, public space because part of the idea is that there'll be the possibility of street performance, outdoor performance that's connected with somehow connected with the uh, public room of the, of the building. And partly, and also, um, one thing I'm stressing this term, which I think is really uh, somewhat successful, is really trying to see materials and construction, not just as operational, not just as how do we build the building, but how do they actually further the ideas of the project itself, right? The, the sort of fundamental thesis ideas of the project itself. So those are, those are some of the things that, um, that I'm thinking about when I think about defining this project. Now, why London? Um, London is a place that I've been visiting for uh, about 40 years. I've worked professionally there. I've done research there. I go there all the time. And, um, and for you, so, so it's something I'd like to do is introduce you to this place that I really, I really do love. Um, it's a chance to learn about one of the most vibrant, cultural, uh, culturally active cities in the world. London has come a long way in the last 40 years, and it's really, really terrific. And I think it's a wonderful sort of place in which a building like this uh, should and could and has happened. It's a place that has um, a lot of complex, architecturally and historically interesting sites, and I'll show some of those 
to you in a minute. Uh, it's got a long history of buildings, obviously from Shakespeare and even before Shakespeare on, of significant buildings for theater, music, artistic production. And finally, there's a lot of information available about the city, about the buildings in the city, uh, that will play into our investigations with respect to the with respect to the um, with respect to the project. Um, so the project is going to include um, an indoor performance theater, a flexible outdoor space for formal and inf informal performance, uh, spaces for production, scene shops, lighting shops, all of that stuff, public lobby, uh, other necessary spaces. I try to limit the size of the uh, of the program. That's always the case in my in my studios. I try to be somewhere around between 40 and 60,000 square feet because I think that that's a manageable size. It's big enough to, for the building to be complex, small enough so that it can actually be handled as a as a studio project. At the same time, within this framework, within this framework of this particular uh, list of list of spaces. Uh, each student is going to be developing their own interpretation of the idea, their own uh, choice of what performance art is going to be um, is going to be um, actually uh, featured in the building, and um, what's the thesis? What's the idea of how this building relates to the city? How this building actually relates to the idea of production production in the city? So there's a lot of room for interpretation. And we're going to put these two things together. One is the, the overall framework of what the building is, and the second is your own idea, your own individual idea of how to interpret these things. What are your own interests? Are, are your interests in music? Are your interests in drama? Are your interests in something else? So there's a thesis, right? And there's a thesis component, which is going to happen in the, in the fall, but at the same time, there is this framework within which that's going to actually take place. Now, I have a series of sites that I'm thinking about and um, um, uh, and which I'm going to be thinking more about on a trip to London uh, in early in early July. These are all places that I know. Um, I, I've, I lived in Islington uh, when I first came to London a long, long, long time ago. I live in Peckham now whenever I'm in London. Whitechapel and Dalston are places that I've Studied and researched in the last in the last couple of years. There there are sites in all of these places that are that are possible, right? So that, for example, in Peckham, right, there is uh, where I live. When I'm there, here's this building called the Peckham Library, designed by Will Alsop. It's on. It's 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 um. Where is it? It's here. It's right here, right? There's a, a sort of high street there, right? You enter the sort of public precinct of that of that building going through this kind of um, arched structure which you see here directly across the street from that arched structure there are a couple of one story commercial buildings and one of the things I'm considering about and, and those are right there so I'm considering actually taking those commercial buildings out right and using the site that's roughly in that position right so that's one possibility the um, a second possibility is in Whitechapel. It's a place that I um, have done research in over the last couple of years. Uh, this is actually a site that I used for a 484, 584 studio, um, not this past fall, but the fall before that in Portland. It's a triangular site that's in the middle of a block, right? But that it, it has places which come forward to the main street. Uh, with build with one story buildings which i 'm imagining uh, that would become part part of our site the, we designed uh, last year we designed this um, uh, building that's that was for production this is uh, jesus fernandez 's project from from uh, uh, that four eighty four studio but this is one possibility for that site something that 's mostly embedded in the block but which comes forward to the main street for its for its uh, public face. Um, another, another possibility is Islington, this neighborhood where I lived in before when I first came to, um, came to London, right? It's a site that's uh, um, right here. It's, it's, a, it's a space, the site would include this two-story building 
and a space behind it, which is which has the entrance to an underground underground station. I think this site is probably less likely because um, uh, we would have to take over buildings that are next door to it because this literally is the platform over the tracks which which sort of come across the road like this. So so although the building could be supported, it wouldn't we we wouldn't actually be able to uh, go down, right? The final, the final possible site is in a neighborhood called Dalston, which is north, north of the center. So if you look at London, I didn't, I didn't point this out, the West End, the Parliament, all of that is sort of over here. All of these sites that I'm thinking about are sort of to the east of that uh, in a line going, going north-south. This is a site that we studied last year pretty extensively. It's actually a new square that was carved out of an existing, existing parking lot. Right to the north of that square, right. So this is the square here. Uh, to the north of that square, there's some of the existing parking lot which was not which was not used for this project. I'm imagining that this might be the site for the project. This has its own difficulties because um, it's pretty shallow, right? It's only about 40 or 50 feet deep, right? In order to use this site, we'd have to do one of two things or both. One is imagine that the main performance hall is literally underneath the plaza, which is a pretty interesting solution. The other is that we might take over one of the buildings that's to the north of the, of the site, which I'd want to do if we use this, this uh, site, um, because I don't think one solution is enough. So what I'm going to do is this, this, um, this uh, July, early July, I'm going to be there. I'm going to make some choices and document these sites really well. Um, and uh, whether it'll come down to one site that I choose, two sites that we'll choose from as a studio, two sites that you have some choice over, I'm not sure yet. But in any event, what I will have in September is a pretty clear sense. And not, not only clear sense, but a lot of documentation of, of um, possible, possible sites. So the way the, uh, the way the thing's going to work is that there's, a, there's going to be a fall seminar. In that seminar, um, people will write individual thesis statements, develop specific building programs, and there'll be extensive documentation of the London site through maps, photographs, and historical research. We will also have the uh, benefit of one or two colleagues who are here in Oregon, who've spent several years in London and who, and who know the city even, even better than I do and who know architectural practice in London um, very, very well. These tasks of the seminar will be, will be supported by a series of presentations that I will give about London. Um, we'll go to live performances and, and have tours of local performing arts, um, uh, performing arts venues. Um, and uh, there'll be a lot of study of architectural precedents of buildings for performance and production. Um, in the winter, the first term of the studio, obviously basic schematic design of the building um, based on your program that you will have written in the fall, um, and there'll be em emphasis on carrying through those conceptual ideas from the fall, development of what you might call the form-giving features of the main performance hall, including issues of, uh, uh, of the basic stage configuration and sight lines, because all that really needs to be worked out pretty early on in the, in the process, and um, early inclusion of issues of uh, physical and cultural sustainability in the design. Um, the way I run the studio is that we have weekly pinups in the fall, I'm sorry, in the winter term, and that really helps to keep things uh, moving along really well. And the idea is to have schematic resolution of the project by the end of the fall term. There is the possibility of a site visit. I don't have any money to buy you plane tickets to London. I wish I did. But we can discuss it. And if people, if enough people in the studio are interested in going, either in winter or spring, we can certainly, I'm happy to go to London any time at all. So. So we can we can certainly we can certainly talk about that. But I am expecting that there will be considerable amount of documentation and knowledge about the sites that we're actually going to be uh, working on. Finally, in, in the spring, um, uh, 
the, the schematic design will have been completed uh, and will do building and systems development again as an elaboration of the basic scheme and as a, an elaboration of the ideas of the building which will have been developed in the fall term. Uh, focused investigations every week, whether those have to do with structure, mechanical systems, development of the main room, development of the outdoor spaces, whatever it is. Um, the idea that everyone in their own thesis and in, their, in the development of the project will have a, an aspect of the building that's really important to you, right? Whether it has to do with, with something to do with stagecraft or something that has to do with the outdoor space or something that has to do with the public space of the building uh, that, or something that has to do with some technical issue like acoustics, there's a chance to develop that in the second term of the studio. And um, obviously, uh, strong presentation uh, for the, for the uh, final, final review. Um, so um, the stu in the studio, uh, I think that what's important is really that architectural investigation should happen through architectural means. Lots of drawings, lots of models, lots of, lots of uh, once, we, once we get through the fall, right, which is the time for, for writing stuff down and studying precedents, not that that doesn't continue, but I think, I think then is the time to really work on the building, on the building itself. And, um, uh, and, and, and so that's what the winter and spring are really going to be, be about. My studios are very collaborative. People tend to work with each other. I mean, they're individual projects, but people tend to work with each other, collaborate, work in studio. And so it's a pretty, pretty nice, nice atmosphere and helpful atmosphere. Uh, and finally, I am pretty rigorous in the way that I uh, deal with the building, deal with questions, deal with, with design, and so forth. So that's basically it. I am um, available for questions if you have any, and um, I'll be, you know where to find me. Okay, thanks a lot. can get all the lights on. Hey, Nancy, we can get all the lights on. One. There we go. Ooh, that thing is crazy. Wow. All right. Well, you're welcome to stay standing. Uh, good afternoon. Very happy to be here to discuss the terminal studio that I'll be teaching. Now, I haven't done one in a couple of years, and I do a few different things. Uh, the basic idea is we're going to be thinking about sustainability at the district level. What does it mean to create healthy and sustainable communities that connect urban design with architecture? And I have a couple interests. Uh, I like to ski, uh, and the U.S. government is running out of money, uh, and we have a ski resort that is a fabulous ski resort not too far away, uh, Mount Bachelor. In fact, I'm heading there tonight to ski for a few hours tomorrow morning and Sunday morning before it warms up a little bit. They have a lot of land there, uh, but you can't stay there. The staff can't stay there. Really, there's nowhere to go except Ben, so there's a lot of driving involved. So the idea here is how can you make a sustainable ski resort? Uh, how can you do it in a way that lets people that make very little money working there live there? How can we think about affordable housing? How can we think about adequate housing? How can we think about all those elements that can come with the resort community? But we also think about it within the context of the federal government's budget crisis. Uh, we're going to be consulting with the National Forest Service thinking about ways long-term they could use their land differently. 
As you know, there's a restriction against developing a national forest land, so right now they can't do that. Uh, but we've been working with folks in Washington, D.C., is can that change? Do they have to mow down all their trees to make money? Perhaps they could lease land for 99 years. So the idea of creating a resort at Mount Bachelor Village is going to be one concept. Another concept is what about in downtown Eugene? A lot of studios have been on downtown Eugene. Uh, we're going to think about Eugene not from the context of its current code, but from the context of a future code and future plans that might consist of that. So if you're interested in sustainability either kind of out at the edge or in the heart of a place, that's what we're going to be discussing in this studio, focused on the idea of sustainability. So you're going to have a choice uh, to pick one of these projects. We're going to be working through the course of the term, trying to identify what the needs are going to be. And the, fo the focus of the studio is more about design process. So the idea is whether you're doing a project in London, whether you're doing a project in San Francisco, in Bend, or in Eugene, there's a process that we as designers follow. In my opinion, it begins with the establishment of a clear vision, a set of design principles and goals that we want to achieve. Then we go through and do a careful site analysis. We work with communities to identify what they want. We understand documents through historical review. We get an understanding of the culture and the built environment through our analysis. So we do that process of visioning, and analysis, and then we go through the development of alternatives. It might be building alternatives, it might be urban design alternatives, but we look at those alternatives within the context of the, of the vision that you'll be developing. And then you work through a preferred alternative, and you develop that to whatever scale is appropriate for your studio. In this studio, we're going to be at the big scale, looking at urban design, and then we're going to focus in at the small scale, looking at building design, and we're going to follow that process. So the idea of mixing these two, it's not necessarily about the places, but it's about processes we as designers use. So that is the pro approach there. We're going to integrate certainly urban design and creating an urban design either for the ski village or for downtown Eugene. And we're going to look at a small focus core area in downtown Eugene. And we're going to throw out the current code and see what could we do that's more appropriate to really understand do we need to grow out in Eugene or can we grow up. So I'm going to be very flexible in terms of what you want to propose in downtown Eugene, certainly in terms of building heights. Uh, we're going to look at that. Also, we're going to be doing some measurements. How do you measure sustainability? Maybe borrowing a bit from EHOB, uh, but the idea is we do need to measure. As part of the process for the project out in the Forest Service land, we're going to be proposing a new federal planning code uh, for the U.S. government. We've been consulting with them on other projects, but the idea is there is no planning code. Uh, and what would the Forest Service, National Park Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, what would their code be for developing land? And how do we measure whether or not they've succeeded? So we'll look at measurement tools, lead for neighborhood development, for example, will be one. And how can they actually measure performance and sustainability? So we'll look at that at the urban design level, and then we'll do some measurements at the building design level. So that idea of quantifying where we go uh, is important. Now, to do this, we'll begin by the crafting of a code. So the, sprint, the first term, the winter term, is going to be the urban design term. You'll need to decide which project you want to move forward with. Not right away. You know, we're going to do a field visit. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the idea of creating an urban design plan. When I talk about a form-based code, what we're saying is we're creating a, a, a code based on a sustainable form. So you have to figure out what that form is. So in this case, a form-based code is like planning codes that we have all over the place. Currently, there's a code in place in Eugene, and you'll have to study that and understand that, but you don't have to follow that. There is no code out on the Forest Service land, so it'll be the application of a code. A form-based code has key elements that you'll be preparing. The first is an illustrative plan. You know, those are common plans that we see all over the place. The second is a regulating plan. How do we actually regulate that in a way that's flexible for developers to come in with their resources and actually follow the vision that's established. Then we have building standards that look at building heights and fenestration and building form and massing. There's street standards that deal with street sections and landscaping of the streets. And then there are landscape standards, primarily dealing with trees, shrubs, and ground cover. So those elements will make the form-based code, and that will be developed during the winter term. And then during the spring term, you'll pick a building site that has been identified in the regulating plan, and you'll need to follow that based on the code that was developed. So let's say you pick a site in downtown Eugene. Maybe the code allows for a multi-story office building. Who knows, 20, 30 stories. Uh, you pick that site. You'll have to follow the rules that were established in the previous term. 
You'll develop the program initially in the spring term, and then you'll work through the detailed design of the building itself. Uh, now, the way we're going to do this uh, is fairly collaboratively. So in the winter term, you'll be working in groups, most likely two groups. There'll be the downtown Eugene group, and then there'll be the Mount Bachelor Village group. And you'll be working the code in small teams. And then in the spring term, individually, you'll pick a building that you want to design. So imagine you go to a city, and a code has been designed, and you have to follow those rules. And that's what you'll be doing in the spring term. So the idea is you'll be stuck with what you developed earlier. I did this earlier in a terminal studio. It's quite fun. Uh, occasionally, run across parts of the code you don't like. Uh, so the code writing team from the previous term, they serve as the planning commission. Uh, and you can apply for variances to the code. But you have to make clear justification. It might be the code you wrote, and you might realize that you made some mistakes. And that's certainly OK, uh, because this is an iterative learning process. So really, you're going to design three things. You'll design a code, an urban design code. You'll design a building. And then you're going to design policy. So the idea that this will translate into policy, right now the Forest Service is more interested than the city of Eugene. Uh, but we're going to give the city of Eugene a form-based code for its core of downtown. Uh, and we'll talk to the neighborhood groups and all of that, and we'll get involved in the public arena. Uh, but it's a hypothetical studio. Uh, so in this case, I think that we're able to focus a little bit more freely on what our educational objectives are. Uh, we're going to do a lot. I follow Howard's model, a lot of drawing, a lot of model making. Uh, there'll be a final booklet that's developed to document what you're intending uh, to do. Now, why these two places? Well, we can get to them pretty easily. Uh, they're fun places to be, and there's a lot of opportunities out there uh, for development. And how do we understand what the potentials are? Well, our field trip is going to be up to Whistler Blackcomb. Uh, we're going to figure out the dates right around the first part of the term. Uh, hopefully, we get a few folks that are van certified, because uh, we'll be driving up vans. I have some funding that will pay for the trip to Whistler Blackcomb. It won't pay for your lift tickets, uh, but we can figure something out. Uh, so we'll look at Whistler Blackcomb, all of us together, as a studio. Uh, what can we learn from Whistler Blackcomb? And then we'll drive back. We'll stop by Vancouver, BC. And Vancouver will be our other case study that all of us will look at. And what can we learn from Vancouver in terms of urban design and architecture? And then we'll head back to Eugene. We'll develop those as precedent studies. Certainly, there are other precedent studies, other ski villages. I would encourage you, if you're interested in the ski village part, uh, to go to other places, maybe over winter break, go to Park City or Lake Tahoe or who knows where. Uh, but come back with precedence uh, on this. So that is really the idea of the studio. Uh, it's about engaging you in the making of a code, engaging you in the process of integrating urban design and architecture together, and thinking about how do we actually execute that? How do we translate that into some rules uh, that folks can follow in a flexible way? Because the worst thing that can happen, and you probably have seen this, is this big apartment building over by the arena. Uh, it's this five-story monstrosity. Uh, built behind Market of Choice. How many of you have seen that thing? See, that there is the failure of planning. Uh, in fact, you know those little townhomes next to that building? You know those little cute three-story townhomes? The owner of those townhomes, they wanted to build on that site where the apartment buildings are. That, that to me, would have been a great solution. The city of Eugene wouldn't let them because the planning code didn't allow for that. So what we end up with is this monstrosity. And you can see that as you compare those two buildings side by side. What a form-based code would do is eliminate that problem. You start to think about how you could tastefully address existing conditions. There are existing conditions at Mount Bachelor. There are existing lodges that aren't going anywhere. There's existing medical clinics that aren't going anywhere. So how do we fit into that existing condition? How do we understand the ecology of the place? Certainly, very sensitive landscape. We'll be having lectures on ecology and thinking about integrating into that ecological system. So it's not just about the building fabric itself. How do you do that in downtown Eugene? What are the ecological issues down there? What are the cultural issues that we need to understand? So we'll be thinking about how that informs the development of our principles. Certainly, we'll build on material that we've talked about in human context, material that you've talked about in other courses, to try and develop your program. But we're going to recognize that a program is not a sum of square footage. The program is more of an intention of where we want to go, of the vision and the measurable principles that we want to achieve. Because what I do as a studio instructor uh, is I just can't give you my opinion, whether I hate it or not. What I want to do is help you understand where you want to go. And then I can look at your projects based on your own vision and challenge you to make certain that you're meeting your vision. I might not agree with it, but if it's your vision, the idea is that you're trying to achieve that. So it's really about your interest and your ideas. 
engaging you in the urban design and architecture process for a studio that a couple of fun places uh, and a studio field trip that could be pretty interesting. So I'm going to keep it fairly short and address any questions you might have. Any questions or comments, thoughts? How many of you have written a form-based code? Anybody? Don't know. <laughs> a little hands, the Vietnam studio folks, uh, a little bit. Anybody to skiers? Yeah, OK. All right. Question? All right, there you go. Ski or go to downtown Eugene. I can't see my notes, so two. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay. So if you have come out from under your studio desk at all this term, you might have read that the proportion of carbon in the atmosphere two weeks ago in the tropics reached 400 parts per million. And to give that any context, the scientists have uh, agreed that 350 parts per million is probably manageable or survivable. So. Um, to put that into an architectural context, we might remind ourselves or offer the other premise for the way I'm setting up the studio, that half of the US annual carbon emissions come from the built environment, the construction and operations of the built environment. Um, and, then, and then to look at it at even finer grain, sort of five to eight percent of global emissions around the world are coming from the production just of one construction material of cement for construction. That's the groundwork. But the big question is really, and this is the question that drives a lot of my work in practice and in teaching and research, what really does it mean to design within this environmental or atmospheric context? We're right there looking south. So think about the life cycle of a whole building. So from the time the materials for the building are extracted, the construction of the building, the operations of the building, and the heating, the cooling, the lights, et cetera, and then the end of the life of the building. So if you take a building that is maybe 50 years, well, has a lifespan of about 50 years, and if you assume that it's some, some place like the Northwest, where our power grid has some proportionally lower global, global warming potential fuel sources like hydroelectric or wind, and that maybe the construction materials for the building came from a place that's maybe more coal-based, this is a typical scenario then you could say that a half of the life cycle carbon emissions for that building are occurring in the, construct, in the manufacturing and construction phase of the materials. Okay. So this is maybe what it would look like in terms of its carbon emissions over its lifetime. The first couple of years, poof, lots of emissions associated with manufacturing and construction of the building, and then the rest of it spread out over the next maybe 48 years. So I'm really concerned with this. Especially in the management of the atmosphere. What does it mean in the immediate term before we solve all the other problems? How do we uh, maybe temper some of our major emissions? So on the left, this is what really high carbon emissions building materials look like. And on the right, this is what really low carbon emissions materials look like. So low meaning stuff that comes from the crust of the earth, or maybe stuff like straw, or maybe even sod or timber, if you're thinking, have, depending how you think about land uses, maybe even sequestering carbon. Um, I think this is a really tough dichotomy because the chic architecture is made out of this stuff. And sometimes some of the more fringe or dumpier architecture is made out of this stuff. So the question that I want to start with is, what is an architecture that combines industrial technologies and a high level of design experimentation with really, really low carbon materials? So um, thinking about what it means to be um, high experimentation, high design, I really love the Toledo Museum of Art Glass Pavilion by Sana. Um, 
different ways of using the, the materials that were on the left hand of the screen, the really um, high uh, embodied carbon, carbon footprint or global warming type of materials like concrete, maybe glass. These are the things I think are really beautiful. But how do you get that kind of detailing with these other materials? And there's a few relatively contemporary projects that are starting to nibble at this. Um, the Takra Naturum caught my eye, the Swedish nature center that's just a long A-frame and the whole wall and roof, it's sort of the wall is the roof, on the outside is all thatch as a weather barrier. I'm interested also in the Arup project, so this global engineering firm that did a school in the highlands of India in the earthquake zone of compressed earth block with a seismic timber frame. So these materials that are really um, appropriate environmentally but with a high level of design and engineering. And you've probably seen in the Northwest this um, cultural center that has maybe not, it, maybe it's actually more superficial than actually the core of the building, but a, um, some really nice rammed earth, um, actually a facade or a wrapping. So these are buildings that I don't think achieve quite what I want to in the studio, but are starting to nibble at the question of what is really, really nice design with really, really uh, low carbon emissions materials. Okay, so this is a studio about environmental performance. Performance of the building envelope, uh, maybe the life cycle global warming impact of the building, but it's also a studio about beauty and maybe, maybe about the performance, building performance in terms of the performance of beauty. I'm starting to develop a hypothesis for myself that the things that are most beautiful to me are those that are truly in keeping with my own values. So the things that I value are things like life, refinement, um, efficiency, light, wellness, the long term. So the question uh, coming from that is how can we use this unusually rig rigorous design, this obsession with a view maybe, the view of architecture and experience, a detail and a building in the context of equally rigorous environmental ethics, maybe this very long view to make something unusually beautiful. I'm also wondering if th this beauty maybe could be the kind of beauty that comes from leaving things out, maybe more than including them. In an architectural drawing, how can the drawing be more beautiful because it's including less information than if it was than a, a drawing that was trying to be more, um, well, everything. So I'm thinking about abstract drawing. I'm thinking of minimalist art, minimalist landscape, uh, land art, or this idea of beauty through taking away In the experience of the building, also the way we describe a building. Maybe you know James Terrell, the environmental artist who makes these sky spaces that are just white chambers with a very, very thin edge. So you sit in the chamber and watch the sky, and then the art is the way this isolated piece of sky is perceived by you at that moment and, as, and how it changes. Okay, so three questions. And this is really just repeating what I've set up. What is an architecture that combines industrial technologies and a high level of design experimentation with very low carbon emission materials? And two, how can we use unusually rigorous design, and that is obsession, with things like experience and detail, um, in the context of equally rigorous environmental ethics, the long view, to make something unusually beautiful? And then can we do that by editing out rather than adding in? James Terrell sky space style. Okay. So the vehicle for responding to those three questions will be, uh, oops, it's cut off at the bottom, a 3,000 square foot environmental art museum. And I'll tell you more about what I mean by that. And the site is here in the Willamette Valley. This is where we are. So you can see you know, we're here. So it's sort of halfway between us and Corvallis. This is the slide that I just showed you, and I'll go back to zoom in again. So we're somewhere along 90, Highway 99W here between Finley Wildlife Refuge and the Willamette River here in agricultural land. This is an interesting thing in itself. So um, the questions related to the site will be what does it mean to take agricultural land out of service or to change the use of it into something else, especially thinking about carbon and sustainable communities and what and the way we use agriculture in the Willamette Valley. 
Um, also thinking about um, the ecology of the Willamette River or the Willamette Valley in general with a great example in the Finley Wildlife Refuge with some really nicely restored um, land. And then again, this Museum of Environmental Art. So well, I'll t we're going to learn about, <laughs> about what this is in this structure. So there are certain things that you're going to need to learn in order to carry this out well. And this is how I'm figuring to offer it to you. So you need things like understanding the theory of environmental art. How do you do that? Um, you need to understand Willamette Valley ecology. Uh, you need to understand building technologies that aren't the usual ones that maybe you learned from me in building construction. Um, you need to know art museum operations especially in the context of uh, immaterial art, conceptual or non-traditional media performance, and also large-scale uh, installations. So exceptionally big, exceptionally small, uh, exceptionally conceptual. So the fall seminar, we will um, take apart environmental art, the theory of. We'll look at different construction uh, systems. We'll deal with the ecology of Willamette Valley agriculture in particular, and learn about art museum operations in this context. And that's a three credit seminar in the fall. We're also going to need to block out some weekends in the fall to go and see the projects in the Northwest that are doing some of these things. The Tacoma Tidal Resonance Chamber is the nearest, very recent um, rammed earth project. Um, and there's other earth and straw projects we can see. And we should also get out there in the Willamette Valley um, and learn firsthand about some of the ecology. Um, to help with the crash course and what it means to be thinking about environmental art. Uh, I will take you to the Center for Art and Environment in Reno, Nevada. I'm not, I, don't, I really don't think that skiing at Tahoe can compete with skiing at Whistler. But that's the January 3rd through 5th, so the couple days before the winter term starts. And it's worked well in the past to have students meet me there on their way back from winter break. And then we'll uh, return, um, then meet again in Eugene. And I have funding to offset that, but not totally cover it. Um, so there we'll see art, meet with artists and curators. This is a really great emerging um, program in art and environment. I'm interested in having you understand environmental art so that you can you know, program a good museum. I also think that the way that environmental art is used to shape or can be understood to shape the way that people perceive the natural world around them is a great lesson for architects to think about how architecture might also do some of the same things to shape or change the way we perceive the natural environment. OK. And then the winter and spring, I think I, um, this is the third terminal studio I've taught in a row. And what, one of the things that has worked very well that I'd like to keep is a really high level of momentum through the whole two terms of the terminal studio. So none of this think, 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 worry, 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 work like hell at the end. <laughs> More like I'll give you very structured projects all through so it's kind of more, more like this, right? So um, expect then to work very hard at the beginning as much as at the end with things like, well, I'd really like to focus on the model um, at multiple scales. So especially with some of these detailing this construction uh, systems that are we're inventing ourselves. We're going to have to think starting with uh, what is a physical experience we want or something wondrous that we want to have happen in the building. How would you actually do that? with a construction detail, and can you mock that up? And then how can you abstract that into a physical model at a smaller scale? And then what is a drawing, thinking about still um, w making things beautiful by taking them away, what is the most beautiful drawing that sums up or really emotes the, the condition that you're trying to uh, choreograph? OK. Um, that's the structure. So seminar, weekend days in the fall, meet in Reno, and then intense two terms. I think just a couple more clues to get to offer you to see if this is really your thing. Um, you might look at CLUI, the Center for Land Use Interpretation. This is a um, placeless museum of the way we use land, in which the way that what the art is the way, is looking at the way we've marked land in terms of its sectioning, um, and also um, maybe a, looking at other ways of marking it. The textbook that I'll use to structure our theoretical discussions in the fall is called Nature. And it, it uh, summarizes the history of environmental art and the current practice of environmental art. Uh, the Willamette River Trail. This is a great new website that uh, 
offers a way of accessing the, the whole of the Willamette River. And if you have time this summer, it would be fantastic to take a piece of it and maybe run the Willamette on your own this summer using um, some of the, the river trail infrastructure. Um, the book Earth Architecture uh, is a book that compiles the latest examples of earth architecture that are combining earth, or earth traditions with contemporary tr uh, industrial detailing to make some really lovely projects. So seeing where, where earth architecture is coming away from the margins maybe or maybe more into the, the experimental or um, more considered design. So I'm available to answer questions. Uh, between now and when you have to select. So, thank you. Okay, while we're waiting for this to, uh, to boot up, uh, okay, there's a, there's a story of why I don't use radio mics. Okay, halfway through a lecture with Jim Tice about 10 years ago, I did the first half, he did the second half. Halfway through, I decided, okay, I'm done, I'm going to go to the bathroom. When I came back in, everybody was tittering. Okay. <laughs> So I don't use radio mics anymore. <laughs> so if you can, you're tough. Okay. So I know you've been here a long time, and I'll try to make this as short as possible. Okay, I'll do the usual thing. You get to do exactly what you like. Okay. Right? And you know that's not true. So. <laughs> why this is taking so long. Okay, so uh, you learned probably in the first couple of days, if not before, uh, that one of the things that buildings are supposed to do is to keep the weather out. Um, most of them do. Uh, and most of them do so, so effectively that they actually inadvertently deprive their building occupants of two essential requirements for their long-term, our long-term well-being. Contact with nature and contact with change in their environment. So how do you fancy spending 40 hours a week in a place like this? And many people do. So there's a solution, it seems to me, and it's right outside.
difficult to blow your ear. Okay, you get it, okay? Um, so as we uh, tragically saw earlier this week, um, the weather can be benign, beautiful, and deadly, but it's certainly not boring, okay? And that's a description that you could, you could probably apply to the space we're in, especially now, uh, but it's certainly true of many interior environments. So the weather can be too interesting, interior environments can be not interesting enough, Maybe there's a connection there. So, um, you've already read this by now. The atmosphere out there is the biggest wilderness in our world. It's also the most available, universally available source of nature and change. Most of the time, we, when we think of nature, we think of something green. Well, before there's something green, there has to be this stuff called the weather. Take a look at Mars. Okay. No atmosphere, uh, none of that green stuff. So, um, um, as Aaron was just talking about, we need to take care of the atmosphere around us. That's the first thing. Right? If that's gone, well, there's not much else. So the project in the Outside In studio will, is going to explore how buildings, whose traditionally primary, one of the primary roles of buildings is to keep the weather out, to protect us from the weather, might at the same time, not instead of, be able to bring, to welcome the weather in. The weather as, as an example of nature, okay. the biggest example of nature. So how, and the spaces that we're in, by the way, uh, a conservative estimate is that your generation, if not mine, will spend well over 90% of your entire life in such buildings. So it will matter what, what that environment's going to be like. But the fact is that we're still physiologically not that different from our ancestors, that we belong out there, and we come in here for convenience sake, but physiologically, we're beings that really belong in that environment. Right now. Why do you think people ski? Why do you think people go to the forest? Because that's where, deep inside at a genetic level, that's what we know is good for us. So, um, so how exactly does, is it possible to bring the weather indoors, or the movement of the weather, without undermining that central role of most buildings, at least, shelter. So some examples of how you can do that. So we enclose external space with interior space. You can project external movement onto interiors, and you can bank project. I promise that this will be quick. So let's look at the three suspects then. The sun, um, the low-hanging fruit here is light and shade. The problem with light and shade is that it doesn't move. I'd say it's a problem from a narrow perspective. It's not perceptible in real time. You notice the movement of these things after the fact. And take it from someone who's tried. You can't watch or you can't see 
normally moving um, solar shadows, except under certain conditions, and it depends on the latitude. Um, at, uh, at our latitude, it would take about 80 feet between the source and the projection surface for you to be able to see that move. Okay, I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, uh, it varies according to latitude because the Earth rotates at different speeds, but it's significant. But it is possible, um, in other ways, to, to make the movement of the sun more visible or more noticeable. One way is to break it, to split it into different wavelengths. Um, I'm not going to go into detail as to how this is done, but individual colors can be selectively reflected and refracted, and then they can actually mutate the form of the reflections separately. More familiarly, um, this movement of this solar spectrum is over a half hour, so at six feet. That translates to about 0.04 inches a second. That's just below the threshold of perception. Okay. And if you don't believe me, okay, can you see the leading edge of this same spectrum? Okay, that's moving at about 0.04 inches a second. Very hard to pick up. People claim that they can. Um, Sure, if I can, I can fast forward for, for you. Okay, that's what it does in three minutes. Um, if this were another 20 feet away from its source, uh, a large solar spectrum, then you would be able to actually see it moving. Another way of making the sun's presence felt, though, is through its heating effect. So this is actually how clouds are formed. Okay? Rapid condensation of evaporated water from, a, in this case, a regular composite roof. Okay. Unfortunately, these clouds are not thick enough to cast shadows, so they'd have to be put inside uh, a space. Convection currents are visible. This is the same kind of composite roof, right, under the normal heating conditions. The sun is projecting that uh, through a skylight onto a floor. Feet below. So, different densities of this invisible thing called air can actually cast visible shadows. Okay, this one's fairly self evident. A little less familiar. These are actually multiple images of the sun being created by the pinhole effect through tiny apertures between the leaves, the foliage on a tree. And there are formulae that relate how that can be produced. Okay, these are caustics, okay? a fancy name for bands of bright light okay, created by curved surfaces. In this case, it's the, the concave surfaces of, of a wind-disturbed piece of water that's projecting those. Okay? So this is a reflection. This is actually a refraction through the convex surfaces of water. So the water, the light is passing through the water in this case. Okay? That's the opposite. Okay? It's high school physics. Last one. Again, this one. Okay. So 500 years ago, they figured out in certain cultures how to make nature a part of architecture. This screen is as much a part of this architecture as nothing. Okay, this is a modern impluvium. It's actually raining inside of this building. Okay. Not recommended when you're doing enclosures, but, uh, <laughs> but the, the point is that this could, if not in this case, be made connected to useful rainwater harvesting. Okay. And that's uh, another part of this agenda. It's not just a pretty phenomena, but these, if you have not figured it out yet, sun, wind, and rain are actually the the three primary suspects when it comes to sustainable practices in building, certainly environmental control. Okay, a fish eye view of rain. This is the same building that was projecting caustics earlier. So, okay, this is actually being done with artificial light, uh, projecting rainfall onto an interior. Similarly, this is being intercepted by a translucent screen. Okay, what's going on here is that light is being shown through glazing and the streaks of rain on that glazing are being projected on the material. Okay, so as I mentioned then, 
it's not just about keeping us alert, keeping us contented inside buildings. It's also about um, serious message that that stuff out there is important, enormously important, and there are other ways of getting people to respond to nature and sustainability other than lecturing them all the time. By bringing it to their attention, first of all, but making it obvious how cool this stuff is. It doesn't have to be that way. Look at Mars. Um, so these indoor animation techniques are compatible with the big five sustainable techniques in practices in buildings, um, as opposed to building or construction. Um, but they're atmosphere sustaining. So in other words, sure, the atmosphere can help us inside buildings, but at the same time, it can heighten people's awareness, hopefully, of how we might be able to value that stuff and maintain to help the atmosphere. Um, so the vehicle for exploring these, this relationship between the weather and building, which is really just a, a recalibration, okay? it's not automatic. Yes, of course, I like to be warm and dry as much as anybody else, but many of our spaces, like the one we're in, completely overdo it and throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay? No connection with the outside. Okay? Um, so there are two centers that are known for having the primary brief of not only tracking and researching the weather, but communicating information about the weather to the public. The National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma, which made the news this week, tragically, uh, and the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. They're both connected to NOAA, okay, which is a federal um, department. The National uh, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric um, I forgot what the acronym of the rest of it means, but they're both under one umbrella organization. This is the National Weather Center in Norman. Uh, considering the interesting stuff that it studies, it's a pretty anodyne building, done about six or seven years ago. Uh, but it's already outgrown, it's full of scientists, it's on the University of Oklahoma campus, and it, they've already earmarked an expansion plan or this site for expansion. So the premise of the project is that as part of that extension, possibly the whole of it, right, uh, that there would be a much more publicly accessible component to the building. This is really for the experts, okay? but the public interface really doesn't exist. And they completely failed to make the weather interesting, okay? apart from sort of computer uh, animations, etc. Right? They're pretty good about the national weather. What they're really not good at is the weather just that far away, the thickness of a piece of glass away, right around the building, which they completely ignore. So the premise would be how to make people aware of how cool, how interesting, how important, how valuable the atmosphere is right around them, right here. The other site, very different up in the uh, Rockies, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Okay, this is the site before it was developed. It's on a table mesa. Um, I can't remember the elevation, about 4,500 feet. Uh, this is Ian Pay's, uh, I guess it's an historic landmark now, it must be, it's over 50 years. Um, uh, and the component of the National um, Center for Atmospheric Research that Pay never got to build, well, there were several, there was another tower, but there was also a visitor center that was planned for this area uh, on the center of the car parking area. It got cut out of the budget um, along with about a third of the rest of the building. So again, two very contrasting sites, but the premise, the intent in both cases would be to make visitors to these places, and there are significant numbers, um, to give them an interface and to turn the weather into something real and something that buildings actively engage us with rather than just reject and keep out. Okay. So uh, there'll be a seminar in the fall, um, and the program in detail then, the expectation would be that we'll work that out in the fall. That I do uh, have some money, and I'm trying to figure out how to get us to both of these sites in, um, in one trip. 
that's easier said than done with the current airline schedules, but that's the intent, is to try to go to both before you make up, have to make up your mind which site you want to be on. And I think uh, since you've been here so long and been pretty patient, um, I've got an email address. If you've got questions, uh, drop me an email. Thanks.